Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to be taking a look at plastic pollution and PFAS. My guest today is an expert on this topic. Mr. Rob Bilat is an American environmental attorney from Cincinnati, Ohio. Mr. Bilat is known for the lawsuits against DuPont on behalf of plaintiffs from West Virginia and has spent more than 20 years litigating hazardous dumping of dangerous chemicals. He has a book that highlights many of these issues called Exposure, Poisoned Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle Against DuPont. Rob Blatt, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's just jump right into your book. What is the thrust of the book? I'm sure a lot of it was contained right in the title, but what was the purpose of writing that book? Really was to try to provide uh, in one place a history of how we ended up with completely man-made toxic chemicals contaminating the drinking water of virtually the entire planet and the blood of virtually every living creature on the planet. How does something that like that happen? How did it happen during modern times? And uh, what were the factors that led to, to this you know, pretty unprecedented global contamination story? Now, I mentioned in the opening uh, PFAS, P-F-A-S, what, what does that term stand for? It's sort of a, a tongue twister. These are per and polyfluoroalkylated substances, uh, abbreviated as PFAS. They're also referred to nowadays as forever chemicals. These, again, are completely man-made chemicals that didn't exist on the planet prior to the 1940s, but over the last 70 to 80 years, have been used in an incredible array of different types of products uh, from stain resistant, waterproof clothing, carpeting, fast food wrappers, firefighting foam, computer chips, that they're now virtually all over the planet. It sounds as though the, this plastic, these microscopic plastic, I don't know if you call them microbes or whatever, are out here. They're just about in everything we use, are they not? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, these chemicals have been used to make so many different products over the last 70, 80 years. And I think most of us had no idea that these chemicals were out there being used in all these different products. Um, they were essentially unregulated. Um, you know, they were, again, invented right after World War II. And a lot of our federal rules and regulations didn't start to roll out here in the U.S. till the 70s and the 80s. So these were chemicals that were that were pushed out into the world and started being used in all these different products, uh, really without any kind of regulation. And frankly, a lot of them never, of course, then ended up on ingredients uh, labels or any kind of product labeling. So they've been used in a massive amount of products, but we, the rest of us, are only just now becoming aware that they're even out there and that they've been used. What, what is being done today to focus attention on this problem and to rectify it? And is there some way we can get these, clean this up or get this out of our system? Because we're all affected by it. Every, all of us on this program, everybody in the state of Kentucky and Ohio is affected to some degree. So what can be done? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, in fact, our awareness of all of this really started with cows and with a farmer out in West Virginia uh, over 20 years ago that was trying to find out why his cows were dying after drinking a bunch of white foaming water coming out of a nearby landfill. And that led us to really start to uncover uh, what was going on with these chemicals, the fact that they even existed, um, and led to essentially a 20-year process to get this information out to the rest of the world, to, to the scientific community, to regulators, to the public that these chemicals are out there, here are all the different products they've been used in, here's how they're getting out into the environment, out into the world. And, and really, what really helped spur public awareness has been over the last couple of years, not only things like the book, Exposure, but films. There's a documentary, The Devil We Know. Uh, there's a feature film called Dark Waters that came out in 2019. I think these really help the public understand what this stuff was, why this matters to all of us, because what it shows, these, these, these films showed, this isn't just happening in isolated farms, either in West Virginia or in Maine. This is something happening all over the planet and is affecting all of us. 
and really having those films and books and things come out over the last couple of years has really helped people to understand that the problem exists. And most importantly, also encourage people to know standing up, speaking out about this can actually get this problem fixed. We're now seeing over the last several years, uh, a lot of efforts to adopt new rules, new regulations, new laws, really trying to, to, to begin restricting these materials and to try to deal with the contamination problem and to start cleaning all this up. So really having these stories get out there and through, through not only the films, but, but discussions like what we're having today to let people understand there's something we can do about this. And people are speaking out now and actually contacting companies. Consumers are raising their voices saying, we don't want these in our products. And so even before the rules and the laws are changing, companies are now voluntarily pulling these out of their products. And we're seeing pretty significant dramatic change. Now, the well-known actor Mark Ruffalo was in that movie, Dark Waters. Did he play you? And how did he get involved in that movie? He did. In fact, uh, an article came out in January of 2016 in the New York Times Magazine that had summarized the, this whole history of what, what was going on with this chemical. And the chemical we were dealing with in particular was one of these PFAS forever chemicals called PFOA. And it was a chemical that had been used by DuPont in making Teflon down at a plant along the Ohio River. And um, this New York Times Magazine story came out, not only summarizing what had happened with the chemical down in West Virginia along the Ohio River, but also pointing out really for the first time that this stuff was present all over the country and likely in water all over the country. Mark Ruffalo read that article and started to be concerned. He, he considered himself pretty active in water rights and water protection and was shocked when he read that article to know that something like this was happening in the United States all across the country and nobody really knew about it. So he reached out to me actually and, and really wanted to find a way to, to, to do a film to help, help the, the, the rest of the public understand that this was happening and to really convey this story. And I think did a, a pretty fantastic job when he teamed up with the folks at Participant Media on the film Dark Waters. That's very commendable, it certainly is. And it's excellent that he got involved in this. This is a, this brings back memories of a lot of different scientific studies. I remember the tobacco industry and how they had tobacco studies showing the ill effects of nicotine and smoking and that type of thing. The oil industry in particular did scientific studies highlighting how uh, using gasoline, oil, what have you, is contributing to climate change, melting of the glaciers. Did the chemical companies, did they have this, these types of studies that pointed this out decades ago, or is it, is it new news to them? Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> this is a story where the, the risks and the, the potential harms from these chemicals were well known to the, the companies that were making these chemicals and using them. Companies like DuPont and 3M who invented these chemicals going back to the 1960s or 70s. Unfortunately, what we learned through finally getting access to a lot of the company's internal documents was that they were well aware of the risks and harms from these chemicals. Going back decades, they had been doing their own internal studies and animals, they had been monitoring workers. Um, and unfortunately, not only did they have that information, they covered it up. They withheld it from the regulatory agencies, from the public. And really what you see, uh, the story that I, I, I walk folks through in the book Exposure, where you see in the films that we've discussed, is what it took to get that information out to the rest of us, to the public, to the, to scientists, to regulators. And that took over 20 years to do that. That is that's just incredible. That seems to be the reaction of, well, probably every industry when they find that they have problems that may be adversely affecting people. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS or Community Access Television Station, 
or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you have a podcast, or you just have a computer. You like our show and you would like to share it with others, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking with an expert on plastic pollution and, and a, a term called PFAS, which is getting gaining more credibility or traction, I should say, in the media. Mr. Rob Lott is an American environmental attorney from Cincinnati, Ohio. He's also the author of a book titled Exposure, Poison Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle Against DuPont. Rob, we're talking about the, the really the horrific effects of the of these plastic pollution. And of course, I'm guessing that it, it would impact each person or each uh, livestock or whatever differently. But what are some of the major detriments of this type of pollution? Do they associate it with lung cancer, um, uh, kidney failure, uh, just brain tumors? What, what are you, I'm, I'm sure we can't document all of them, but what are some of the major issues? Yeah, with, with these particular chemicals that we're talking about, these PFOS forever chemicals, um, unfortunately, they've been, they've been shown to have a connection with a wide variety of different possible adverse health effects. In humans, uh, one of these chemicals in particular, PFOA, the one that is the focus of the book in the films, the one that was used by DuPont, for example, in making Teflon, that chemical has been linked with kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, preeclampsia, and high cholesterol. And that was through independent scientists who looked at all of the data, all the animal studies, all the human data, uh, conducted uh, massive new studies that took over seven years, 69,000 people participated in these new studies. And these scientists were able to, to link this chemical, just one of these PFOS chemicals, with these six diseases back in 2012. Um, and since then, unfortunately, the new science that's continued to develop has raised even, a, even more concern, particularly with respect to how these chemicals might impact our immune system. And that can lead to a whole cascade of events throughout life. One in particular that's uh, raising a lot of attention recently has been the potential of these chemicals to possibly decrease the effectiveness of vaccines. And in, in particular, there's concern about, you know, with the COVID vaccine, here are man-made chemicals that are in drinking water all over the planet, in human blood all over the planet. Almost over 90% of the people on earth now have these chemicals in their blood. And they have links with these types of potential effects, particularly while we're dealing with a, with a pandemic. So there's real concern among the scientific community. And because of that, as this science has developed, what we've seen is the scientists, the regulators are suggesting that the, the potentially safe levels of these chemicals keep dropping. And there's more concern about exposure to even the smallest levels of these chemicals now. We had the US EPA just come out a couple months ago and essentially say that if you can detect PFOA using current methods in drinking water, it's too high. So real, real concerns about the potential health effects. It certainly is. Now you mentioned the EPA and I understand the Biden administration is on board trying to focus on this problem, but this, this is truly an international problem, obviously, it, because these products are sold and consumed in other parts of the world. Water gets infected, milk gets infected. Uh, the United Nations just recently, last year, at the end of last year, had a major conference on plastic pollution and is working on a treaty to help prevent that or to curb some of the ill effects. What, what can be done by the United Nations international bodies to help with this problem? Yeah, and as you mentioned, I mean, this is really a global issue at this point. I mean, these chemicals, they don't respect state or national boundaries. They can move through the air, they move through the water, they move in products all over the planet. You know, even though we started to phase out the manufacture of some of these in the US, some of that manufacturing moved overseas. And unfortunately, that stuff still can get up into the air get into water droplets in the clouds and rain down all over the planet. In fact, we just had a, a recent paper that came out looking at the fact that 
this chemical we've been talking about, PFOA, it's found in rainwater all over the planet, you know, in, in, in Tibet and in the polar ice caps. So what we've seen over the last couple of years is as people start to really understand and appreciate the scope and scale of this, we're seeing discussions now begin at the international level, at the EU, at the UN, to try to figure out how do we address this in a comprehensive global way that doesn't simply move the problem from one place to another. Because these chemicals don't, <laughs> they don't care which country they're in, and we need to be able to address them uh, in the way in which they move globally, universally. That's true. It's like secondhand smoke or smoking. It doesn't matter. Smoke goes any place and it can create lung cancer and other, other problems. So it certainly is. Well, have, do we have the technology? Do the companies have the technology to help reduce the, the PFAS particles, the PFOA, or to make products safer than what they were before? Because we're talking about these items being in your rugs, and your linens, whatever it may be, but do they have the technology to help reduce it? Yeah, and in fact, as, as the stories come out, what we've seen is uh, really dramatic uh, changes in that regard. You know, first of all, the, the, the main goal is, of course, to stop putting more of these chemicals into the world, stop them from going into new products. And there are a number of companies that have already identified uh, alternative chemicals to use or alternative materials to use instead of these PFAS forever chemicals. And even in those situations where these chemicals are still being used, there are technologies out there that can filter these materials out of the air before it goes into the smokestack, or it can filter it out of the water before it's discharged into a river or into a lake. And some of these technologies go back decades. And unfortunately, could have and should have been installed many, many years ago. Um, we're seeing that start to happen in a more global manner now. Um, so you know, the goals are not only to stop <laughs> and to try to clean up what's already out there, uh, but to prevent additional future emissions of these things from occurring through products and manufacturing operations. And the technologies, a lot of technologies are there and there's a huge frankly, a huge market right now for companies that can come up with uh, innovative ways to remove these chemicals or to filter them out. And of course, water is one of the key repositories, I guess, for these chemicals. Do things like uh, reverse osmosis filtration system help or do, does that cut down on it or is it almost ineffective? Yeah, you know, what we've found is there are a number of, of water filtration systems out there that can remove these from water. You know, for some of these, the ones we know the most about uh, are the ones that have eight carbons. We call them C8s, things like PFOA, the one we've been talking about that's a Teflon, it was used in Teflon, or PFOS that was used in Scotchgard or firefighting foams. Granular activated carbon reverse osmosis, ion exchange systems are pretty good at removing those C8s. But over the years, as we've, as we've transitioned away from using C8s, companies have started bringing out replacement chemicals, things like C4s, C6s, that are still part of the same family of chemicals. And unfortunately, some of these water treatment technologies their, their effectiveness varies depending on what type of these chemicals are. So we're now finding out that some of these treatment technologies um, um, have to be uh, either beefed up or changed a bit to deal with this sort of ever evolving group of man-made chemicals. What recommendations would you make to our policymakers, to the media, to people who are just watching the program? And this program goes worldwide. What types of information. I mean, the information you put out today is extremely helpful, but are there any other recommendations that we need to be aware of or action we need to take? Yeah, I think most importantly, people need to recognize, you know, what we're dealing with here is a global public health threat. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I, I, I did the book and, and participated in these films and are participating in shows like yours, because this is a global public health threat that's gone fairly unrecognized for decades. So the most important thing is making sure this story gets out to folks, that people understand where are these chemicals used, which products still use them, and how So you start to give people the tools to be able to start minimizing their exposures. Up to now, most of us never had that opportunity. We weren't told 
which products these chemicals were in. We didn't know we were being exposed through our drinking water or the products we were buying. So getting the information out is critical. Getting the story out is critical. That allows people to start making choices. Then we need to start making sure that the policymakers, the folks that, are, that have the capability to regulate these or restrict, or at least start to take action to protect the public that they understand the science that does exist on these chemicals, how much is known, how much of information we do have that warrants taking steps now to protect the public going forward. So again, education and making sure people have access to the, to the information that's already out there that really is uh, documenting this, this pretty significant public health threat. It certainly is. And we need to have more of this information in classrooms. And we need the media to focus on articles much more than they have in the past. But Rob Lott, this is a very important issue. And I want to thank you so much for sharing today, uh, doing an excellent program. It was very informative and very interesting. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure being here. My pleasure. I am Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.